Teach me to walk in the light of His love. Teach me to pray to my Father above. Teach me to know all the things that are right. Teach me, teach me to walk in the Hello everyone, welcome to this week's Walk in the Light event. My name is Elder Holbrook. And my name is Elder Barron, and we'll be tonight's hosts. As we get the event started and people join in, we would love to see where everyone is tuning in from. Let us know in the comments along with any questions you would like to ask Brother Wilcox in the Q&A portion of this event. Tonight's guest speaker is Bradley R. Wilcox. He has served in several leadership positions for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and he is currently serving as a second counselor in the Young Men General Presidency for the Church. However, before we introduce him a little more, we would love to open up tonight's event with an opening musical number duet by Sister Trithal and Sister Preciado. Following them, the opening prayer will be offered by Elder Moody, all of whom are serving as missionaries from the Massachusetts Boston Mission. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful for this wonderful day today. Please bless that we can have our hearts enlightened as we listen to Brad Wilcox and all that he has to offer and teach us in this devotional. And Father, please bless that we can pray to know that what is being taught is true and that we can keep the commandments. And please bless that we can learn something new tonight. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. That was amazing. Thank you so much. As we said before tonight, we are joined with Brother Wilcox. Brother Brad Wilcox is a professor in the Department of Ancient Scripture at Brigham Young University. He is the author of the books, The Continuous Atonement, The Continuous Conversion, Because of the Messiah in a Manger, and the BYU devotional address, His Grace is Sufficient. Brother Wilcox continues to inspire many with his insights and heartfelt messages about Jesus Christ. Brother Wilcox, the time is all yours. Thank you so much. I'm proud of these missionaries. You're doing a great work. I just think it's amazing how creative these missionaries have become, reaching out like this on social media. You know, I was speaking to some young people the other day, and they said, this would be a lousy time to serve a mission. I said, no, this is a great time to serve a mission. And they said, no, why? Because COVID and all the things happening in the world, this would be a lousy time. I said, no, this is a great time to serve a mission. Because six months ago, nobody wanted to talk about God. Nobody wanted to talk about organized religion. Nobody wanted to talk or hear a message about Jesus Christ. But all of a sudden, the Titanic tilted. And suddenly, people are realizing that they were missing something in their lives. Suddenly, they're realizing that they do need God, and that they do need organized religion, that they do need Jesus Christ in their lives. And so this is a great time to serve a mission. Think about uh, the Titanic. It was built to be an unsinkable ship. The newspapers in England said God himself cannot sink this ship. Now, why? Why were they so confident? Well, because the Titanic was built in a way that no ship before it had been built. Previously, they built ships with as one container. But then if the ship got a hole in it, then the whole container would fill with water and the ship would go down. But the Titanic was built in compartments. So the thinking was, if one compartment gets a hole and fills with water, the ship could still stay afloat until it reached its destination. Well, you know the story. On its maiden voyage, the Titanic sank. Why? Because it hit an iceberg that punched holes clear along the side of the entire ship. And that meant that many compartments were filling with water at the same time. The captain said, go to your lifeboats. But you know what? The passengers had bought the lie. The passengers believed they were on an unsinkable ship. They said, why would we go on a lifeboat? I don't want to get on a lifeboat out in the middle of that cold Atlantic Ocean in the dark. Now, they knew something had happened. I mean, the ship had stopped, 
but the lights were on, the orchestra was playing, the first class passengers were sipping champagne. So they just didn't realize the seriousness of this. And they thought for sure, they were like a bunch of kids in junior high who won't leave the building during a fire drill because they say, oh, well, we know it's a fire drill, it's not real. And that's how the passengers were acting. They were thinking, hey, we know the captain's gonna come on in a minute and tell us we can go back to our, our bedrooms. So we'll just stay here on the unsinkable ship until they tell us that everything's okay. But then the Titanic tilted. And suddenly, where did everyone want to go? To the lifeboats. Have you ever wondered why there were 126 men who lived? When the rule of the day was women and children first, why did 126 men live? Well, if you just watched the movie, you think it's because the crew was inexperienced and they set, sent the first lifeboats out half full. But if you read the accounts the way I have, if you read the accounts from the actual survivors, you'll realize that the reason that they were sending the lifeboats out half full isn't because the crew was inexperienced. It's because the passengers wouldn't get on. The women and children would not get on. Crew members were begging them with tears in their eyes to get on. They said, no, I'm not going out on that little lifeboat out there. I'll just stay here where it's safe. But then the Titanic tilted. Now, six months ago, six months ago, I read an article in the newspaper. A newspaper, children, is something we used to use in the olden days. I read an article in the newspaper six months ago that said nothing can stop this economy. The stock market has never been stronger. The unemployment rate has never been lower. Nothing can stop this economy. And along came a little virus that we can't even see with our eyes. And it brought the whole world to its knees. And this world, the Titanic, tilted. Suddenly, this ship that was unsinkable started to sink. And suddenly, people started looking toward the lifeboat. Suddenly, they realized that maybe they didn't have everything they needed in their lives. Our last general conference which is where the church leaders speak to members and non-members alike, was held in April. And it was viewed by 5 million more people than had previously ever viewed the conference. So whatever the previous record was as far as viewers, it was topped by 5 million additional viewers. Why? Because suddenly people were looking to the lifeboat. Suddenly people wanted to know, is there a God? Does he care? Is there something to being part of an organized religion? Does Jesus Christ matter in today's modern world? Suddenly they started to look. In Phoenix, Arizona, there was a man who had been going to a big mega Christian church. And when churches closed in March, he... Uh, was given a list from his pastor. And he's, the pastor said, would you please call these people and find out if they're okay? The man said, anything I can do to help. He started calling people and they said, who are you? Why are you calling us? Quit calling. He said, well, I'm from your church. No, we don't know you. You don't know us, quit calling us. He said, by the time that happened about four or five times, he realized that he was missing something. He thought he was part of a Christian community. He thought he was part of a group that would pull together when times got hard. And instead he found out that nobody wanted to help him. Nobody even knew him. So he remembered a member of the Church of Jesus Christ who had been on his street and how involved he had been in his congregation. This man in Phoenix, Arizona reached out to the church Missionaries started teaching him online. Pretty soon he ended up joining the church. He said, not only have I felt, do I feel now like I'm part of a true group of Christians who are ready to pull together during hard times, 
But he says, I'm learning so much more about my Savior. Now his wife and his teenage daughters are also learning from the missionaries online. He said, I felt like something was missing in my life. And when the Titanic tilted, it revealed that. See, he thought everything was just fine. He was on an unsinkable ship. But then the ship started to sink. Is this a bad time to be on a mission? Oh, no. This is a great time for these missionaries to be on a mission because they are in the lifeboat. The church is the lifeboat. And they are reaching out and trying to help as many people as possible find the security, the safety, the direction, the peace, the joy that's felt in a lifeboat, even amid a disaster. You're looking around you in the world and realizing that about 19 years ago, in when we had 911, yesterday was the anniversary of 911. And 19 years ago, that disaster pulled our country together, pulled people together. It united us. Now, 19 years later, we're facing many disasters. And instead of pulling us together, we're letting it pull us apart. We're realizing that this is not an unsinkable ship. And that's why it's so important that we are in the lifeboat and that we're reaching out and helping others find that as well. Don't apologize for believing in God. Right here in this study done by Pew Research, it's called the Global God Divide. And not only does it talk about how there are more young people now declaring themselves to be atheists than ever before in history, it's also saying that there are more people who claim that you can be a moral and good person without believing in God. You don't have to believe in God. You believe in God. I won't believe in God. It doesn't matter. Oh, but it does matter because we're realizing that the way we feel about God starts impacting the way we treat and feel about each other. It makes a difference in how we treat each other, especially when there is a crisis. In the crisis, in the moment of crisis, the believers are the ones who are turning and reaching out to others. The ones who don't believe, they can say all they want. Oh, yeah, but I can still be a moral and good person. And they can until there's a crisis. And the crisis reveals true colors. And suddenly, the fact that they don't believe in God, they suddenly feel justified in stepping on whoever they have to step on to reach their own selfish ambitions and desires to save themselves. A man spoke at Brigham Young University. His name was Brett Sharfs. He's a law professor. And he said, yeah, but what if we're wrong? What if we're wrong? He said, what if there's no God? What if God doesn't exist? Then he said this, I'm willing to be wrong in this way. If it means that believing and treating others as if they are children of God with the potential of becoming beings like unto a perfect and perfectly loving God, I would rather make the mistake of attributing meaning and love to a universe that is meaningless and indifferent than vice versa. Besides, Brother Scharf says, we're not wrong. Love is the most powerful force in the universe. We can't see love. You can't prove love. You can't prove to me that there's such a thing as love. He says, love is the most powerful force in the universe. And I'm not sure we have any reason to believe love is real if we reject the existence of God, who is the source of that love. We don't apologize for believing in God. We, the, when times get hard, it validates our belief. And we realize that we're not wrong because the way we feel about God 
affects how we feel about ourselves and how we treat others. Well, lots of people say, oh, I believe in God. I just don't believe in organized religion. If you haven't heard this phrase, then you've had your head in the sand. Because a lot of people I know say, oh, I'm spiritual. I'm just not religious. I mean, I love, I love God and I believe in God, but I just don't feel like I need to be religious. I don't need organized religion. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles for the Church of Jesus Christ spoke at Brigham Young University a couple years ago, and he said this. He said, if, all, if we all lived alone on a mountaintop, then great. Spirituality would be great. That would be all we would need. We could all sit on a mountaintop and say, I'm spiritual. I love everyone. But guess what? We don't live on mountaintops. We live in communities and societies. We live in families and we live with others. And that's why we need religion because religion is the group practice of spirituality. See, easy to sit on a mountaintop and say, I love everyone, I love everyone. Try feeling that way when you're driving on a freeway. Yeah, I love everyone, I love everyone. Yeah, until your little brother gets in your stuff again, even though you told him to stay out of your room. See, in a moment like that, you don't need spirituality. You need religion. You need the norms, the standards, the expectations that force us to pull our mountaintop spirituality right down to where the rubber hits the road. It pushes us to live the way we claim we believe. If we believe we should love everyone, it's the organized religion that pushes us to actually put that belief into practice. I had one of my students say, Brother Wilcox, I don't believe in organized religion anymore. I said, well, how do you feel about organized airports? I mean, would you want to fly out of an airport where everybody just does whatever he wants, whenever he wants? Oh, yeah, we don't have a pilot today because he didn't feel like coming in. But don't worry, one of the flight attendants thinks he can do it. What? We don't have a security line. No, terrorists, welcome. Because nobody felt like showing up today. So you may arrive at your destination. You may not. Depends on whether the people in the tower are actually doing their job or playing video games. I wouldn't feel comfortable flying out of an airport like that. How come nobody in the country would agree to fly out of a disorganized airport? And yet we walk around thinking that we don't need organized religion take a look at what's going on in the country right now we need organized religion we need the group practice of spirituality when we're organized we can feel safe and we can reach our destination when we're organized we can help others since covid hit We've all felt very hopeless because we've been locked down and we see problems all over the world and we think, gosh, I wish I could do something. Well, guess what? Because I'm a member of, the, of an organized religion, I am doing something. Do you realize that just since COVID hit in March, since the lockdown, do you realize that the Church of Jesus Christ has been involved with over 400 significant service projects in over 100 countries. Our chapels are being used as overflow hospitals all through South America. There are people who are out of work who are getting food for their families, members and non-members alike, because this is an organized religion. I can't even get a passport right now to go to South America and try to help people. But we have boots on the ground because we're part of an organized religion. We have boots on the ground that can be making a difference. So while many churches are closing their doors and asking for financial aid from the government, I'm grateful to be part of an organized religion that has prepared and planned for this kind of a time 
so that we don't have to shut our doors. We can continue to reach out and help people and make a difference in the world. Now, we've talked about the importance of believing in God. We've talked about the importance of bringing our mountaintop spirituality down to where the rubber hits the road in an organized manner. And now let's talk about the importance of Jesus Christ. A student of mine forwarded me, forwarded me a post that said, Jesus Christ was racist. We need to pull every statue of Jesus Christ down in the whole country because he only taught Jews and he didn't care about the Gentiles. He was a racist. I know friends who are a little nervous right now about raising the Christian flag because suddenly Christianity isn't popular. And suddenly, for many people, Christianity has become some sort of an enemy. For a lot of people, Christianity is part of the problem and not part of the solution. So do we turn our backs on Jesus Christ because it's no longer politically correct? No. We stand by our Savior because he is the captain of the lifeboat. And we are so grateful for him. I spoke to a young man in our church uh, several years ago. We were waiting at his house for his parents to come home. And, and uh, that was back in the olden days when we used to do home teaching. But uh, we were there with the family waiting for, for the dad and I said to this young man, why do you believe in Jesus? And he said, well, everybody does. And I said, well, everybody in your world does, but not everybody in the world. So why do you believe? Do you just believe because everybody else does? He said, no. I said, then why do you believe in Christ? He said, well, because it's in the Bible. I said, you're absolutely right. But what if somebody came along and said the Bible is just myth? The Bible is a fairy tale. It's a folk tale. It's just been passed down from oral tradition. You can't trust what's in the Bible. Would you still believe in Christ? He said, yes. I said, why? He said, well, because it's history. A.D., B.C., the whole calendar revolves around Christ. I said, you're absolutely right. But what if somebody came along and started talking about before common era and after common era? What if somebody took Jesus right out of history? Would you still believe? And this young man didn't have any other answers for me. And that, that matters. Because the answers he gave are the answers that most Christians give for believing in Christ. But there has to be more. Years and years ago, I went to a big youth conference that was being held in the eastern part of Canada in Toronto. The mission president, who takes care of the missionaries, like these young missionaries that you've been meeting through this fireside, the mission president was taking me from one chapel to another chapel where I was going to speak again. And he said, do you mind if we swing by the mission home and I could change? I said, no problem. We went by the mission home. He said, let me flip on the news and you can watch the news while I get changed and get, a, get us a little bite to eat. Well, on the news, they were interviewing the director of a movie. Now, most of the young people listening won't remember this movie. But if there's a few people out there who are more mature youth, you might remember, the movie was called The Last Temptation of Christ. And it portrayed Christ in a very human way. If I'm going to be point blank, it portrayed Jesus in a very sexual way. And Christians were upset about the movie. Oh my goodness, they were picketing the theaters, they were writing letters to the editor, they were on the TV shows, they were upset. Well, here I was listening to the director of the film who was being interviewed. And the lady who was interviewing him said, I think the reason so many people are upset about your movie is because it doesn't follow the Bible's interpretation of Christ's life. And he said this. 
So, the Bible. He said that thing's been through so many hands, so many translations. He said if there's anything true left in the Bible at all, it wasn't even written by Jesus. It doesn't say the Bible by Jesus Christ. It was written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They interpreted Christ's life. So if they interpreted Christ's life, who's to say that I don't have the same right to interpret Christ's life that they had? And who's to say that my interpretation isn't better than theirs? Who's to say? Who's to say? Well, the commentator had no answer for this very bold movie director, but the mission president did. He came up behind me tying his tie, and he said, Brad, speaking to me, we are to say, because we are the only Christians on the planet whose testimony of Christ doesn't just depend on tradition or history or the Bible alone. Some people say, oh, you Latter-day Saints worship a different Jesus. But that's not the case. We worship the same Jesus they worship. But we do have a stronger foundation for our faith in Jesus Christ. Why do we believe in Jesus Christ? Because Joseph Smith saw him. Why do we believe? Because we have the Book of Mormon that goes with the Bible and testifies of the Savior. Why do we believe? Because we have living prophets and apostles on the earth today who are playing the same role and doing the same work as Peter, James, and John in Jesus' day. Why do we believe? Because we have the Spirit that touches our spirit. It bypasses our physical senses, and it touches our spirits, and it assures us that we're not wrong. I promise you, you are not wrong to be in a lifeboat or to be looking for a lifeboat because the world has tipped. And you are not wrong to believe in God, even in a time when that is becoming less and less politically correct. You are not wrong to look toward an organized religion. You're not wrong to believe in Jesus Christ, to choose him and to serve him. I hope that tonight the Spirit has touched your spirits and assured you that if there was something you felt like you were missing six months ago, I hope you'll realize that you have the opportunity to find it. Unlike the lifeboats that were on the Titanic, Jesus' lifeboat is large enough to fit as many who are willing to come and to enter. So come aboard. Let the missionaries be your guides. Is this a bad time to be on a mission? No. This is a great time. These missionaries, you can see it in their eyes. You can see it in their countenances. They have found the lifeboat, and they are ready and willing to share. I am so proud of them, and I'm so proud of you. Thanks for listening tonight. Thanks for letting me share my feelings and share my testimony with you. And I leave this surety, this witness, born of my own experience, born of my own study, and born of the Spirit touching my spirit. And I leave this witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Wow. Thank you very much, Brother Wilcox. We, we really appreciate um, the message that you shared, and I'm sure we have, we've all felt the spirit so far. Um, I, I really loved um, what you shared, and and you know, in these times, it, it's really difficult, and it's been a time where so many people in the world have realized that we really do need Jesus Christ, and and as well, we need organized religion, and 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 the Church of Jesus Christ, where where we can find that His true church. So, thank you very much. Well, thank you. I'm glad that you're out there reaching out, helping people find that lifeboat. That's amazing. Thank you so much. 
Well, we're going to move right into the question and answer portion. Um, we have a lot of viewers that are sending in questions, so we're going to pull up the first one. Um, let's see. The, the first question is, how, um, how do you help people who don't want to get in the lifeboat? Yeah. The, the interesting thing is that we have to remember that when you're in a lifeboat, the alternatives are not positive. So yes, are there people floundering around in the ocean who say, I'd rather be in the ocean than the lifeboat? Yeah. Are there people on the Titanic saying, I feel safer here than in the lifeboat? Yes. But the thing is, is that ultimately, the alternatives are going to shrink. Suddenly that ocean water is going to get pretty cold and suddenly that Titanic is going to go down. And so we have to remember that we, this is the place people want. This is where we find joy. There are not many people in the world, at least six months ago, who wanted to talk about God or Jesus or church, but they all want a better life. Immigrants moving clear across the world for a better life. Parents sacrificing to give their children an education because they want them to have a better life. What we have to help people understand is that the better life is not found in the cold ocean or on the sinking ship. The better life is found in the lifeboat. That's what we're, the missionaries, man, sometimes as a missionary, you feel like I'm trying to sell the only true breakfast cereal to people who don't even eat breakfast anymore. And nobody wants what you are offering. But ultimately, people get hungry. And we have to realize that sooner or later, everybody who says, I'm just out here partying, I'm out here partying. Yeah, a few years later, they start hitting rock bottom and suddenly the party isn't what they thought it was. Think of your friends from high school, elders. They used to think you were so crazy because you had these rules. You had these commandments you had to live. You, you couldn't swear like they could. And they thought you were so crazy. But now a few years later, you're on a mission in Boston, Massachusetts, and they're struggling. Their lives are drama, drama, and more drama. We have to convince people that joy is found in Jesus Christ. Joy is found in the lifeboat. The better life they're seeking is found here. And when they stop saying, well, I don't care about religion, and they start saying, I do care about a better life, then we can help them connect the dots and realize that that better life, the joy they seek, it's found here. Look at the countenances of those sisters as they played that musical number. I didn't know what fascinated me more, the music that was coming out of those young ladies or their countenances, just the, the light in their faces. Well, when people have, or when they're sick of that sinking ship, then we have something to offer that they are going to want. Yeah, that's, I totally agree. The, it's not always the easiest choice and or the most comfortable to get in the lifeboat. It, but it's, oh, and that life jacket doesn't do anything for your figure. I'll tell you <laughs> that. Part. But yeah. who cares about that? It's the lifeboat. It's the lifeboat. Right, exactly. Um, thank you very much. So now we'll, we'll go on to the next question. The question is, what would you tell someone that was harmed by organized religion in the past? What would you tell somebody who was harmed by reading a book in the past? What would you tell somebody who was harmed by a teacher in the past? What would you tell somebody who was harmed by a doctor in the past? All doctors are bad. All teachers are bad. Education isn't worth it. Reading a book is of the devil. No. You give somebody a second chance. Yes, have people hurt people in the name of religion? Yes, have people abused and manipulated others in the name of religion? Yes, but come on, give the rest of us a chance. Give others a chance. 
just like you're going to go to an emergency room and you're not going to say, man, there was a doctor who hurt my feelings and told me I had to lose weight. That's what they always tell me. <laughs> I don't just because some doctor hurt my feelings and told me I needed to lose weight. If I'm in a car accident, I'm not going to say, no, don't take me to the emergency room. I'm going to go to the emergency room and trust that there's somebody out there who's doing this for real reasons and out of real love and care. And I promise you, these missionaries, they're serving out of love. They're serving very sincerely. And if you've been hurt in the past, even if you've been hurt by leaders or members of the Church of Jesus Christ, come on, that doesn't mean that everybody in the church is bad. That's an unfounded generalization. And we can we can we can give people the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Thank yeah, you so thank much. you. That is really true. You know, us as humans, we're not perfect and and we all make mistakes. Um, yeah, but we know that that Jesus Christ is perfect and that he loves all of us. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. Our next question is, what would you say to someone that has overwhelming anxiety these days? I'd say get off the sinking ship and get in a lifeboat. Gosh, if you're on a sinking ship, of course you're feeling anxiety. Of course you are. No wonder if you're watching the news 24-7 instead of watching Walk in the Light firesides, <laughs> then you're going to feel anxious. You're going to feel worried. The way our politicians are working, they want people to feel afraid on both sides because it's going to motivate people. But I just want you to know that there is a place where you can find peace. There was a study done at Brigham Young University by a man named Dan Judd. He's the Dean of Religious Education at BYU. And in the study, they looked at over 600 university students and they found that those who understand grace, those who understand this enabling power, this divine help, this endowment of strength that we call grace, those who understood that, those who had felt that in their lives, those who felt like they didn't have to get their lives in order to go to God and Jesus, that God and Jesus were willing to meet them where they were and help them get their lives in order. Those that understood grace showed lower levels of depression, lower levels of anxiety, lower levels of perfectionism, lower levels of shame, lower levels of scrupulosity or feeling like you always have something to confess. This was a study that was published in the American Psychological Association Journal. This is legit research and it's saying that when you understand the gift of grace, it makes a difference. So if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling depressed, yes, we seek professional help, but we can also seek the help that's offered from the Savior. And that grace makes a difference. It makes a difference in our lives. There's research to show that that's the case. That's great. Thank you. I, I know I'm definitely grateful for um, the grace of Jesus Christ in my life. Thank you. All right, we'll go on to the next question. Um, it is, Brad, how do you keep your testimony independent of any outside pressure? Yeah, I think that would have been a good question to ask Joseph Smith. That would have been a good question to ask Brigham Young. When they send an army out to Utah to crush the rebellious Latter-day Saints. And the only reason they sent the army wasn't because the saints were being rebellious. It's because they wanted to get the attention off of Kansas because this was before the Civil War. And they thought, gosh, if we can, if we can give somebody, if we can give people someone to hate that's not each other, then maybe we can avoid a civil war. So they focused the attention of everyone on Brigham Young. So unjustly, but there he was. So we ask him, how did he stay strong despite different opinions and different pressures? 
What about Jesus himself? You know, I've often come to the realization, as much as I want to share the gospel with everyone, I've come to the realization that if this church were popular, it would not be Jesus's church. If this church were popular, it wouldn't belong to Christ. Because when, since when was Christ's way popular? He always asks something of us. He asks us to walk a straight and narrow path. You know, I have friends who say, oh, no, your church expects way too much. I'm going to this other church because that, that church doesn't expect anything. And I always say to them, a God who asks nothing of you is making nothing of you. So don't be afraid of being at odds with the world. We don't want to be popular in the world. If we have to do what we have to do to be popular with others, then we're not doing what we have to do to be disciples of Jesus Christ. So don't look sideways for validation. Oh, how many likes did I get on social media? Ooh, how many friends do I have on social media? No, look up. Look up and find your validation. Find your likes. Find your friends. Look in this direction instead of this direction. And believe me, then you'll have that inner strength that says, I'm willing to do what's right. I don't care how many people say I'm wrong. I'm willing to stand up and do what's right. I'm willing to live my life with integrity, whether people are watching me or not. I'm not just going to live a certain way on camera and then a certain way off camera. True integrity, true discipleship, fears, no hidden cameras. Awesome. Thank you. I think that's a really good point. You know, if you think about Jesus Christ in his life, he was one who, who was rejected and, and was unpopular, like you said. And, and sometimes following him is difficult. But, but I, I really know that as we follow him, that, that's what helps us reach our full potential. Elder Holland told some missionaries when the missionaries asked, why does it have to be so hard? Elder Holland said it was never easy for him. Mm -hmm. Why do we expect it to be easy for us? But that's so liberating. It's so joyful to be in a place where you worry more about what God thinks of you than you do about what other people think of you. And that's a joyful place. Some people write me emails and say, your talk on grace really touched my life. Other people write me emails and tell me that I have absolutely no right to be talking about grace. I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, they can write me. Some people like me. Some people don't like me. I mean, some people say, gosh, your talk on grace has over a million views. And other people set up websites to fight against what I taught. Websites. There are, web there are anti Wilcox websites out there. <laughs> wow. So I have to just stop and I have to say, look, in the, in, in the poem, If by Kipling, it says, can you meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same? See, if somebody says triumph, if somebody says disaster, I have to turn to God and say, God, what do you think? And if he's telling me that he's pleased with what I'm trying to do, then I have to keep going. Yeah, this is the opinion that truly matters for sure. Yes. So our next question is, um, it's from De David E. Lucas. It says, I am not an LDS member but I have been studying um, with you guys. For, uh, for me, you are very blessed. 
My question is, how could I believe in religion knowing too much about a bunch of them? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I think in many respects, religion is man-made. But I have found so much, uh, so much to strengthen my faith as I look deeply. Don't look at the surface. My gosh, we live in a world where everybody thinks he's an expert just because he's read some catchphrase soundbite on social media. Everybody's willing to grab some soundbite off social media and make it their opinion. I have students all the time, and they say, well, aren't you afraid that if somebody studies church history, they're going to lose their testimony? I said, no, not if they study it in depth. Well, aren't you afraid if somebody studies science, they're going to lose their, their leaning toward religion? No, not if they study it in depth. Our fear is not that somebody will study it deeply enough. Our fear is that people will study it in a surface way. And in a surface way, then they might feel like they, they might feel disenchanted. But if you're willing to study it deeply enough, then you're going to find that anything we study can strengthen our faith. Oh, my goodness. Um, our doctrine in the church is all truth. That's a pretty big doctrine. All truth. And there's nothing that we can learn and study that's not going to ultimately strengthen us. Even as we learn about each other's religious backgrounds and beliefs, even religions of the world, we don't study other religions to, in some sort of junior high way that says, well, if I can poke holes on, in them, then I'll feel better about myself. No, if we study world religions and we study them deeply enough, we start finding the commonalities that can strengthen our faith rather than hurting our faith. My son came home from an anatomy class when he was in pre-med at BYU. Now he's in a medical school down in Texas. But he used to come home from his anatomy class and he'd say, oh, my gosh, Dad, have you ever thought about your eyeball? Oh, it's so fascinating. It's amazing. He says, how can anybody study about your eyeball and not believe in God? <laughs> so if you study your eyeball and you study it deeply enough, you're going to walk away seeing God's hand. And I promise that will be true in your studies of the church as well. That's awesome. I also think it's very important to go to the, um, to the actual source, um, to the truth, and, and where that's found is um, a big part of that as well. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right, because on the Internet, you can find anybody saying anything. And, uh, and so it is important to learn from 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 sources that are valid and that are reliable. Right. Perfect. Um, we'll just have, we'll end with one more question. Um, the question is, we are teaching a family who are all getting baptized next week, except the mother of the family. She knows it's true, but scared to go against the traditions of her parents. How can we help her? Let me tell you a little story about the man that I serve with right now. The young man president is a man named Steve Lund. His first counselor who serves with us in this presidency is a man named Ahmed Corbett. Ahmed Salim Corbett, African-American, grew up in the projects of Philadelphia. He was raised as a Muslim, Ahmed Salim. His mother had 10 children. The missionary started teaching the mother she and some kids uh, joined the church. Ahmed didn't join right then because he was feeling the same way the mother of this family is. He was feeling like if he joined the church, then he was somehow doing something against his culture, against his religion, against his, his uh, friends. And six months later, he did end up joining the church ended up going on a mission to Puerto Rico. His family moved to New Jersey. He ended up being a state president, then a mission president, 
down in the Dominican Republic, and now he's serving in the Young Men General Presidency at my side. An amazing man. If you ever want to see what the gospel can do in the life of a person, take a look at that man. Take a look at his story. To the missionaries, I say, be patient. You're asking for a very huge change. And this mother, she, she has a right to think this through. And she has a right to be able to say, look, I'm not just going to do this for you or because my family's pressuring me into this. Be patient with her as she walks her faith journey, as she walks her spiritual journey. To the mother, I would say, go look up Ahmed Salim Corbett on the church internet site and realize that he felt just like you. He didn't want to join just because his mom joined. He didn't want to join just because some brothers and sisters were joining. He worried just like you're worrying. But six months later, he came to know for himself that man was invited to speak to the to some of the players for the Utah Jazz because when all this stuff hit about racial racial issues and racial tensions there were a lot of members of the Jazz who said we want to leave Utah we don't want to play here anymore so the owner the coach called Ahmed and said would you please come talk to these players and the players said how can you be a latter day saint and be African-American. And he said, I'm not here to make some sort of political statement. I'm not here making some sort of racial statement. He says, I'm here because Jesus Christ told me this is where he wants me. I'm here because he told me this is the truth. And then he told those jazz players, the church of Jesus Christ is the most unifying force on the planet today. And he said it with his whole heart. Well, guess what? Those players stayed. Now, they didn't join the church, but they believed Ahmed. And I want you to know that you can find out for yourself. And when you do, then you don't have to worry if people are going to be disappointed. You don't have to worry about whether people are going to feel like you're turning your back on them. Because just like Ahmed, you can say, I'm not doing it for all those reasons. I'm doing this because God told me this is what he wants me to do. And when you are on that kind of firm ground, then you will also see what the gospel can do in your life, the difference that Jesus can make. Wow, what a, what a powerful way to end off this, um, this evening. Um, but thank you so much, Brother Wilcox, for your, your awesome testimony and for your remarks. Um, we just want to remind everybody that we, if you'd like to learn more about any of these messages or about Jesus Christ, um, you can send us a message. Send this the Walk in the Light page a message, and we'd love to talk more with you. Um, but we're going to close with a, um, a closing musical number performed by Elder Evans, and then we'll have a closing prayer by Sister Jackson, and we'll go to that point. There are times when you might feel aimless and can't see the places where you belong. But you will find that there is a purpose. It's been there within you all along. And when you're near it, you can almost hear it. It's like a symphony, just keep listening And pretty soon you'll start to figure out your part Everyone plays a piece, and there are melodies In each one of us, oh, it's glorious and you will know how to let it ring out as you discover 
who you are. Others around you will start to wake up to the sounds that are in their hearts. It's so amazing what we're all creating. It's like a symphony. Just keep listening, and pretty soon you'll start to figure out your part. Everyone plays a piece, and there are melodies in each one of us. Oh, it's glorious. And as you feel the notes build, oh, you will see. It's like a symphony, just keep listening. And pretty soon you'll start to figure out your part. Everyone plays a piece and there are melodies in each one of us. Oh, it's glorious. Nuestro querido Padre Sastia, te damos muchas gracias, Padre, por esta hermosa noche y por esta gran oportunidad que tuvimos a escuchar de Brad Wilcox. Gracias, Padre, por el mensaje que él nos compartió y a nos bendigas, Padre, que podemos utilizar este mensaje en nuestras propias vidas para llegar a ser mejores personas. También, Padre, por favor, nos bendigas que podemos compartir este mensaje con la gente alrededor de nosotros. Nos ayudes, Padre, que podemos ayudar a la gente um, a llegar a ser más fuertes y um, más fieles. Por favor, Padre, nos bendigas que podemos hacer lo que necesitamos hacer para compartir tu evangelio y compartir um, la luz que viene de ti, tu Hijo Jesucristo. Por favor, Padre, bendigas a todas las personas que están luchando o sufriendo en este momento, que pueden sentir tu amor y tu misericordia y tu gracia. Gracias, Padre, por tu Hijo Jesucristo y por el gran sacrificio que él hizo para nosotros. Nos ayudes, Padre, que podemos uh, siempre sentir uh, tu amor y tu espíritu uh, con nosotros en todos los momentos. Y te pedimos esas cosas con humildad y amor en el nombre de tu Hijo, amado Jesucristo. Amén. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Brother Wilcox, for joining us tonight. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you. What a wonderful opportunity. Keep up the great work, missionaries. We're proud of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Everybody, uh, we'll, we'll see you all next Saturday at the same time, 7 p.m. We'll have a, another great um, event lined up. Thank you. There's a part for you. <laughs>